Okay. So we're crossing our fingers for all technology to work tonight. The clock up there is about two minutes slow, maybe four minutes slow, but we'll go with everybody else's technologically accurate clocks and phones, which if you have a cell phone, you might want to turn it off or put it on vibrate or something like that. I've often forgotten to do that and think, oh, no, i will phone anybody, and of course it rings, so. <laughs> or put it on vibrate. So thank you so much for coming on this freezing cold night, and uh, so glad that we are not having a snowstorm or a blizzard like they are across the way on the rock, where it's still a state of emergency. Um, I'm Lori Brinklow, for those of you who don't know, I'm the coordinator at the Institute of Island Studies and coordinator of the UNESCO Chair in Island Studies, and our offices are just down the hall on the way to the washroom. If you need a washroom, it's about the third, fourth door on the left, down Mine's the hall. The that's Jim's up Yours yeah. Oh, that's Jim. <laughs> oh, that's it. Don't go there. <laughs> and there's a... <laughs> And there's a water fountain just around the corner if you need it. Um, generally what we do is have, um, I'll do a short introduction and um, then we will have time for questions and Tina is quite happy fielding questions tonight and uh, we're generally out of here by 8.30 unless people really have a lot to say and a lot of questions so I hope you will enjoy it. Um, the Institute of Island Studies, for anybody who doesn't know, we've been around for over 30 years. Um, doing work on the um, environment, culture, and policy governance kinds of things around Prince Edward Island and other islands. So we also have a very popular Master of Arts in Island Studies program. We have the UNESCO Chair in Island Studies and Sustainability. Jim is that actual chair along with Godfrey Baldacchino in Malta. And Jim's going to get up and say a couple of words in a minute. We also have a very active publishing program called Island Studies Press. And we have strong ties with our speaker tonight with uh, jo Tina and Joan, who was our managing editor for many, many years, and she's since retired, so we're sorry to have her go on, but I'm glad you're still designing books like this one that we're going to hear all about tonight. And um, we also have the uh, Journal of I Island Studies Journal, which is an international online peer-reviewed journal all about island studies around the world. Um, so I'll ask Jim to come up and say a few words, and then we'll get going with our introduction. Sure, thanks, Lori. Um, Good to see you all here. Uh, just a couple words about the Institute. For those of you who haven't heard my spiel before, uh, it's got both a local mandate and, a, and an international mandate. Locally, um, one of our goals is to try to bridge the community and the university. And we do that by having events like this. Uh, we do it also by uh, trying to um, use our research to better the community. So that vital signs report, the PI vital signs report that came out uh, before Christmas, the end of November, that was something that we did as, as a research piece, partnering with the Community Foundation. And for those of you who have been around for a little while, know that the Institute, over its 30 years, is, has been instrumental in providing research assistance to a variety of partners and in, in issues like governance and population change and environment and, uh, and administration. Um, at an international level, uh, we are all, the, what we do is we actually network and facilitate. So we use our networks to try to bring different islands and islanders together. So we've done a lot of contracts the last few years with the province of Hainan, this little island of 9.4 million people in the south of China. Uh, and uh, we've also done some work in the Caribbean uh, with a partnership with uh, the University of the West Indies. DC here is a member of the University of West Indies and is, is here on a, on a postdoctoral fellow sort of a grant here. And um, so we, we do a lot of things, try to bring people together who will learn from each other. Um, and I think that's all I'll say for now. I will say that uh, in terms of the master's program, we're right in the heart of recruitment season right now. So either, either you or somebody, you know, if you think that they might be interested in doing a Master of Arts in Island Studies. This is the time for them to get in touch with me. We're having an information session on January 29th and a notice of what the Guardian uh, this Saturday, uh, both at 3 o'clock and at 6 o'clock. Come to see me afterwards. They can do the thesis route for the Masters. Or we are now going to be offering three course and work study routes. One is in island tourism. A second is in sustainable island communities. 
and a third one is in international relations and island public policy. And I know one of our students in island tourism is here, at least right now, and we may have other students here that I, I can't see right now. But. Uh, so if you know of anybody who is interested in, potentially interested in uh, that program, uh, please ask them to see me. And the last bit of news I'll give you is, um, some of you, many of you have already signed this, but if you are interested in keeping abreast of what's taking place in Ireland studies, including when these are scheduled uh, and upcoming, uh, please sign this we, and put your email address down. We promise not to sell your email address to anybody, any political party, <laughs> either north of the border or south of the border. Uh, and um, we, we won't bother you more than that once every three or four weeks when a, when a newsletter goes out. So uh, I'll pass this around and uh, you're welcome to sign up. And I'll turn it back over to the Lord. Thanks, Jim. So, tonight we get to hear all about Beyond the Asylum, the evolution of mental health care in Prince Edward Island from 1846 to 2017 by Dr. Tina Pranger. Or Pranger? Pranger. Pranger. That's good. Third that's time, good. lucky. <laughs> Tina, that's because that's all I know her that's as, good. right? That's good. <laughs> Has had over 35 years of experience in the mental health field as a mental health occupational therapist at St. Jo Joseph's Health Centre and at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry in Toronto. She was a professor of mental health occupational therapy at Queen's University. And then she moved to PEI where she worked for the PEI Department of Health as a researcher and mental health consultant and was the manager of the rehabilitation program. She went on to become a mental health officer at Veterans Affairs Canada. She now lives in Stanley Bridge Prince Edward Island, lovely North Shore, and I know she loves to travel because I'm her Facebook friend. <laughs> her book was launched in November, and by all accounts, our famous bookseller over here, Lori from the Bookmark, the book is selling well. So please welcome Dr. Tina. Hello and welcome. Nice to see so many people interested in this topic, and that's why I keep doing this, because I think this is a very important story. It's a story that uh, has not been told in its entirety in Prince Edward Island before, and it's an important story for islanders to know about. But before I start talking to you, I want to know how many of you know somebody who works or has worked in the mental health system in PDI? Put your hands up. Okay, thank you. Now a, a little more personal question. How many of you know or knew of someone, could be in your family, a friend, in your community, could be yourself, who has used the mental health system in PDL? Doesn't that tell you something? Right? Doesn't that tell you something? Mental health, mental illness as we now call it, has always been with us. And it affects so many of us. It has been called by different names over the years, but there are very few of us who don't know somebody who has been, who suffers or has suffered from what were then called mental troubles. How we as islanders have cared for those individuals has evolved significantly over about a 300 year period of time, beginning with taking care of the mentally ill, and I'm going to use mentally ill, although that's not what it was always known as, in the community to about a hundred years of institutional care and then a move back into more community care to what we have now which is a comprehensive range of services that includes but goes far beyond the asylum or the mental hospital. My book documents uh, that evolution. This is a, my book is a popular history. It's not an academic history. It's meant to be accessible to islanders at large. Um, the sources that I used for this from about the early 1800s to 1960s were archival sources. And I see I have a colleague here from the Public Archives who, uh, who saw me a lot for a <laughs> short period of time. I love the Public Archives. It's a wealth of information. I love history. As I always say to people, I can eat history for breakfast. <laughs> so, um, I love the public archives. I also had a chance to talk to some uh, experts in, at UPEI, like Dr. Sharon Myers from the Department of History, 
From 1960 on, it was mainly reports and documents, and I interviewed 45 people who worked, or still work, in the mental health system across PEI. So I tried to get a, as much information I could in the time period allowed. And when I was doing the research, and when I was doing the writing of the book itself, I, I started to see certain patterns and themes, and I just wanted to highlight a few of those before I launch into the, the substance of the book. The first pattern I noticed is that how we cared for people with mental troubles was shaped by three factors. One was our understanding of what mental troubles were, what caused mental troubles, and then our societal attitudes towards people with mental troubles, and our behavior, how we interacted, and how we interact with them. More specifically, um, these have impacted the type of care we've offered, the focus of that care, the location of the care, the standards of care, as you'll hear later, the funding allocated, and some, this isn't always a positive story, eh? You already know that? <laughs> who's responsible for the care, um, who provides the care, etc. The other theme that became clear to me was that the mental health system was not just used for people with mental illness. A lot of people who did not, and where's my colleague talking about people with developmental challenges? There she is. Uh, there are a lot of people who used, we, we use the mental health system for people who we did not know what to do with, who we didn't understand, who we found a little inconvenient. So you'll see that as a theme running through this as well. Another theme was that care seemed to ebb and flow. There would be periods of optimism and, and positivity and innovation, and then followed by waves of pessimism and some stagnation and sometimes regression. So it wasn't just a smooth, upward curve. People often ask me, um, so is it different here than elsewhere? Well, it's not real. For the most part, the evolution of mental health care, and mental health care in general, is not a whole lot different in PEI than it is across Canada or across North America. That said, there are some differences, because after all, we are an island province. There are some factors that stood out for me. The strong sense of community, the strong sense of family and community and that impact. The rather, what I would call social conservatism, and I mean small c conservatism, particularly around the stigma around mental illness and the embarrassment of having someone in your family who was mentally ill, the tendency to want to hide them away and not talk about them. There's also a, a certain amount of skepticism of change and innovation, so things didn't happen as quickly here as they happened elsewhere across Canada. We're always a little skeptical of those experts from away. Uh -huh. And we have a, a, a good solid dose of political involvement in decisions at all levels of the mental health system. So those are just a few. But let's get into the history itself. It started um, <coughs> in the commute, being located in the community <coughs> up until about the 1840s. The indigenous peoples of the island understood mental illness as a disequilibrium within the individual and between the individual and uh, people around them <coughs> in their community. So care tended to be spiritual and holistic and a lot of community involvement in care. On the other side, the colonial settlers brought, back, brought the ideas from the old country uh, to, to our island, and they called it lunacy, or madness. And they thought of it as hereditary, lifelong, and usually not treatable. So they kept these people at home, they often had little rooms for them in their homes, or they let them wander around the community, sometimes in a harmless way, sometimes not so harmless. It wasn't until about the 1820s that the colonial government, remember we were a colony right up until 1873, um, began to take some responsibility for what they called paupers. And they established what we would, it's kind of like a welfare system that they created. They were called paupers petitions. So family members or friends of 
paupers, and paupers were it's kind of a global category that really meant people who were mentally ill or developmentally challenged or physically disabled. They could apply to the government to get um, financial assistance to help them in caring for their loved ones. Now, in theory, this was good, but in the, um, the archives, and there's a, a reporting system in the Legislative Assembly, and those were the uh, documents that I dug through a lot up because they're available up until the 1960s. They showed how many people had applied for these pauper's petitions and how many people got them. Very few got them. And what they got was really a pittance. It wasn't until... 1846, the government began to see that this wasn't enough, that these pauper's petitions and taking care of people at home was not sufficient. And after much delay, it was a quite a long process, of much delay back and forth with Britain because they needed to get Britain's approval, the Charlottetown Lunatic Asylum was established and opened in 1846 in Brighton on what is now Queen Elizabeth Drive, near the range light. You know where the range light is? Yes. Not, not the lighthouse, but the range light. <laughs> right, about, right about there. It had uh, 20 beds, 10 for lunatics, and 10 for paupers. Because it was also a house of industry, or workhouse. Uh, 20 more beds were added in the 1860s. And it was based on the understanding they had at that time of lunacy, as it was then called, as being caused by two things. Physical ailments, usually of the glands, usually something wrong with your liver or your spleen or your thyroid, or by moral factors. And this is what you hear often in, in the popular, in historical novels and, this and the like. Moral factors such as alcohol abuse, jealousy could cause mental illness, pride, spurned love, to mention just a few. So the approach was to send people away to escape to asylums. And asylums <coughs> in the positive sense of the word, that they were safe escapes from the hurly-burly of life, usually in peaceful rural settings, where people could just get away from all the things that were driving them crazy and hopefully still their mind. The focus, though, was tended to be on long-term custody. People didn't come and go very much. There were some attempts at something called moral treatment, which was a structure which provided a structured routine for the individuals under a kind but firm authority. There was some use of medicines, but there was no real science behind the medicines. They were just medicine wasn't terribly sophisticated at that time. In any case, they were called inmates. And the basement cells, or the basement units, were called cells. And they were cells with bars, like in a prison. The staff uh, were, for the most part, untrained, and they were supervised by a visiting medical officer, Dr. Matheson, at the time. But Dr. Matheson had a number of jobs. This was just one of his jobs. So it's not surprising that by uh, 1874, the quality of care had gone downhill considerably. There was what was called then a scandal. The report of the grand jury, and I didn't know what a grand jury was before I did the research. The grand jury is a group of individuals appointed by government to monitor public institutions. So they would visit these institutions like the jails and the workhouses once or twice a year. Well, they in 1874, under the leadership of Jedediah Carvel, were not impressed. They spoke in no uncertain terms of the overcrowding, 60 or more people in an institution designed for 40, a uh, general state of filth and stench throughout the whole asylum, and I'm quoting what they said in their report. The inhumane conditions in the basement cells, which tended to house the female patients, inmates, I should say, the untrained staff, some of whom were physically abusive with the inmates. As a result, Dr. Mackison was let go. I'm just going to do a little sidebar here. I debated with Joan whether I should stick these sidebars in, but I'm going to try. Because I've been given 45 minutes, and I'm going to try to stick to that. One sidebar is that, did you know that our first premier, 
and a leader of Confederation, George Coles, suffered from mental illness. In 1866, he started suffering from what we would now call um, depression, which was then called melancholia, and had attempted suicide and was identified by 1869 as a person of unsound mind and went to the asylum in St. John, New Brunswick. In 1871, he came back here. There was a special room made for him, of course, at the Charlottetown Asylum. And in his mind, he suffered quite severely from depression, and in his words said that his mind had been given away, that he had no other prospect but to perish and starve, deserted by God and man. Just to show you the severity of what people experience. He did return home in 1872 to be cared for by his family, but, and then died in 1875, never fully recovered. Nobody told you this was going to be an uplifting talk. <laughs> <laughs> it does get better. It does get better. So because of the concerns identified in the scandal, because of the complaints of the neighbors around the asylum about having crazy people walking around in the yard, um, and because of a general movement across the country towards housing people with mental illness in large institutions, and the persistence of the then medical superintendent, Dr. Blanchard, at a 160 beds, what was then called state-of-the-art, Hospital for the Insane was built and opened in 1879. And it existed where Hillsborough Hospital currently is, the Hillsborough Hospital building. Look at the size of that thing. Isn't that huge? It was one of the biggest buildings of PEI at the time. It is the same architectural design as the main building, with, with the, the bricks and the mansard roof. It, uh, the terminology had switched, obviously, from lunatics to the insane. And the, but the insane were still considered incurable and non-functioning and were thought to be better off committed to the asylum or hospital. And they were called residents. Remember, people didn't usually go to these places willingly. They were committed by family and uh, friends. And it didn't take much to commit somebody, just somebody's word sometimes. <clears throat> the care was mainly custodial. There was some moral treatment but the staff were still unskilled. There were large numbers of people in this institution and most stayed for life. The staff lived in the hospital too, as did the superintendent. It was self-sufficient, it had its own farm, its own wharf. It hardly needed any interaction with the outside world. It was like a real sense of community, and so in some ways that was positive, but in another way it was separate from the rest of the one of the things that started to happen, though, and this is what I want to speak to uh, you about, is, um, and I forget your name, I'm sorry, you, Stephanie. Stephanie, was that it became a catch-all for all manner of individuals, not just people with mental illness. It was people we did not know what to do with, the physically disabled, the developmentally challenged, the physically disabled. Um, it was also sometimes used as punishment. It was sometimes used to hide away someone who was inconvenient, someone who perhaps was pregnant when she shouldn't be, uh, sometimes for political reasons. So again, with all good intentions, by 1899, there were repeated articles in The Guardian about the conditions at the hospital, and they set up a, the government set up a commission to inquire into the management of the hospital, and they discovered, once again, overcrowding, 300 patients in a building designed for about 200, so a lot of people would be in the halls and, and there would be doubling up, people would be sharing beds. Um, the food was not fit to be eaten. In the winter, the, some of the conditions were icy cold in, in many of the rooms. They would wake up with snow on their beds. I mean, is this acceptable? Um, staff had to wear overcoats and gloves in the winter. Needless to say, cha some changes were made and Dr. Beth Blanchard was dismissed. That's often an approach we use, right? Whenever things were going wrong, we should fire somebody. And we should hire somebody new. And we hired Dr. Lyle Goodwill, 
who I think that Goodwill Avenue is named after. I think so. I'm just throwing that out there. He was hired in 1900. He was the first superintendent or the first staff person that had specific uh, training in mental health. He's a Prince of Wales grad. He's a Queen's University grad, and he did some extra training at Rockwood Sanatorium in Kingston. We were beginning at that time, when I say we, I mean the island, we're beginning to understand that mental troubles were in fact illnesses and that they could be treated. So Goodwill introduced what he called the hospital idea, focused on treating people in hospital as opposed to custody in an asylum. He decreased the use of restraints, and by restraints I mean the, you know, the stereotypical straitjackets and various other mechanisms by which we try to control people. He had professional training for in-house staff. He set up uh, the first of many uh, nursing <coughs> programs. I didn't know until I started doing this research that there had been schools of nursing attached to Falconwood, the Hospital for the Insane, and Riverside. I didn't know that. I knew there was PCH. I knew there was PEI Hospital and the Charlottetown Hospital, but, and that went on right up until the 1960s. And he insisted that staff wear uniforms. Now this is, this is a typical patient's room. And he was a very eclectic individual who played the banjo, or is that a mandolin? Looks like a mandolin. He was a great photographer. So there are lots of pictures of this era because he took them. A small, do I have time for a segue story? No. Sure. Yeah, do it. Okay, story. This is a story about Edwin Brown. Um, and the reason I wanted to include this story is to show that mental illness is not the person. It's not like someone is the schizophrenic, or the bipolar, or the manic depressive. That it's just one part of who they are. This story takes place in, starts in 1908, when lawyer Edwin O. Brown was charged with forgery of seven mortgages. He said he did it because he believed that another lawyer in his firm was conspiring against him to withhold his salary. Dr. Goodwill, in his wisdom, uh, assessed Brown as insane and committed him to the hospital for the insane. At the same time, ward attendant John Bennell was put in charge of Brown because Brown had, was, tended to be restless and occasionally angry and prone to wandering, so we needed someone a one-on-one. -on -one. Bennell, on the other hand, the ward attendant, was never much of a student, but he decided he wanted to enter the ministry. So he built himself when I did the uh, launch for this book, we were actually on the hospital grounds, he built a shack down at the river, at Hillsborough River, where he could study for his entrance exams and where Brown could wander around. And But soon it dawned on Bunnell that this guy's pretty bright. You know, he's, this is a lawyer. He knows what he's talking about. So for the next two and a half years, Brown um, tutored him in algebra, geometry, Greek, and Latin every day. <laughs> to the point where in 1912 he passed his entrance exams to Prince of Wales College. Bunnell stayed friends with Brown when he visited him when he was in uh, college at Prince of Wales and communicated with him when he went to Dalhousie University. There's more to that story but I don't have time. The 1990 article that I read about this was an article by Bunnell and his daughter where Bunnell wanted to point out he became a very successful minister that he still credited at his age in 1990 much of his success to Edwin O'Brien. This is the infirmary. This was built at a time in the early 1900s. We were at a, a, a phase in, in uh, across North America, really, really, of building institutions that was seen as the, the solution to many issues. The understanding, there was an understanding at that time that the physically disabled, the developmentally challenged, and the poor in fact had different needs than the mentally ill and that they were better off separated from the mentally ill probably for both their sakes so this building was called the infirmary uh, built in 1909 for and the terms then used were for paupers idiots imbeciles or persons of weak mind so people we would now call developmentally challenged uh, care was primarily custodial 
uh, in the 1930s, the infirmary or the, the people in the infirmary moved to the former PEI hospital building on Kensington Avenue. Do you know the one I mean? Which is now an apartment building? That's when it's this building. This building was beside the, it was on the west side of Falcon, of uh, the PEI Hospital for Insane. It's not there anymore. None of these buildings are there anymore. If you stand in front of, if you face Hillsborough Hospital, it would have been to the left. This is an old Hillsborough Hospital mm -hmm. staff person here. Um, it was also interesting to me that staff lived in the hospital and in the infirmary. And in, case, in the case of the infirmary, they lived there with their families. So it was very much a, a self-contained unit. It was its own community. Dr. Goodwill, for instance, you saw the... That this, is where, this is where the offices were. And this is also the apartment for the medical superintendent. So that's where they live. Whereas the staff tended to live on the wards. In 1905, there was such a demand for uh, beds at the hospital. They built a whole new wing. You see that to the, uh, to the right. This is again, if you were faith, this is where Hillsborough Hospital now is. So if you're facing Hillsborough Hospital, it's to the right. They added uh, 50 new beds to the East Wing for female patients and renamed it Falconwood Hospital to reflect Goodwill's hospital idea. It was called Falconwood because it was on the grounds of the former Fal Falconwood farm. The, there was a much more medical approach to care, there were more staff hired with medical training, the individuals there were called patients instead of inmates or residents. The new radical treatment methods that uh, one flew over the cuckoo's nest made famous uh, were popular then. Insulin shock therapy, electric shock therapy, lobotomies, all those what we would now call very experimental approaches, very radical experimental approaches with limited proof and with significant side effects. They were broadly used here as they were across North America in the 30s and 40s. Some of the people that I interviewed, some of the older nurses that I can say older because I'm older, uh, some of the older nurses I interviewed talked about working with patients who'd had lobotomies and what it had uh, done to them. But once again, issues were cropping up to the point where there was a newly established Ministry of Health. There had been no Ministry of Health up until then, and the Minister of Health was Dr. McMillan, who, interestingly, was a bit of a champion for mental health. And he asked the Canadian National Committee for Mental Hygiene, which is the precursor to the Canadian Mental Health Association, to review the state of affairs at Falconwood. And the report was not favorable. They said, and I quote, Falconwood does not compare favorably with other mental hospitals across Canada. They had high admission rates, higher than anywhere else in Canada. <coughs> there were a large number of people admitted with no genuine mental illness. There was really lack of training for uh, the superintendent in modern psychiatry. Inadequate staff numbers. There were a large number of um, patients in the seclusion rooms in the basement. Uh, there was limited treatment or activities to keep people busy doing something, and there were potential fire hazards. Well, a fire happened. Not much later, on December 14, 1931, there was a disastrous fire which destroyed the original hospital. You can see that the it, would, it just gutted it. Right? It was all wooden inside, of course, and they couldn't deal with fires very effectively. So it was all good. At the top, the mansard roof was burnt down. Nine patients died. Unfortunately, because of overcrowding, there were patients in the uh, attics, and they had no way to get out, so they jumped. So unfortunately, they died. And the rest had to be relocated elsewhere. 
little while to decide that maybe we should have replaced the burnt down building. So three years later, a um, 145 bed new Falconwood Hospital was erected. Again, thanks to Minister uh, Dr. McMillan. They went to great lengths to ensure that it was fire safe. Uh, it was a two-story building, it had large wards and private rooms, and each floor had what was called commodious day rooms with exits to the verandas. And the verandas were caged in at that time. Um, some folks that I talk to act, talk, talk about what Islanders or Charlottetowners, let's say that, would do on a Sunday was go for a drive around the grounds and look at the patients on the veranda, caged in. It was kind of like a freak show with them. Thank goodness times have changed, eh? Uh, it, even though it was called the new Falconwood Hospital, it was in fact the women's building because that's who was in there, so it was a women's building for the hospital. A new medical superintendent came on board in uh, 1934. He's an islander from Clyde River, from a family of physicians. He was sent for training in psychiatry by Minister McMillan again, so he was the first psychiatrist on the island. And he, this is a good news story. Uh, you see his name everywhere. You see his name, uh, Hillsborough Hospital is on Murchison Lane, um, CMHA has the Murchison Foundation, the, Mer the, the bu their building is the Murchison Centre, so he was, he's well loved and well respected. He was very well loved by staff and patients alike. He worked hard to enhance the basic physical care of patients. He instilled a deep sense of compassion and caring among staff. And he was a tireless advocate for improving the lives of people living with mental illness in the community. But despite all the things that he did to try to improve conditions, you can see him there as a young man and then as an older man. I love this picture. This is him and his wife at a, a New Year's gala that the patients put on. Look at how nicely dressed up they are. I just think that's sweet. She was a, a nurse at the hospital. Um, so by 1952, he put together a critique because he was still not happy. He still thought things should be better. He felt that there were not enough beds to serve the population of PEI, that we should have treatment in the general hospitals. The physicians were dead against this, so stigma was alive and well. They didn't want crazy people in there with people with physical illnesses. Um, and care at the mental hospital didn't meet proper standards. Once again, overcrowding inadequate staff numbers. And what really struck me in, in this critique of his is his wording that mental health in general had been subject to economic starvation for far too long. But not everything was negative because he persisted and one of his successes is the establishment of the Active Treatment Center in 1957. It's now called Hospital. And you can still see what was the infirmary and became the men's building beside it there. So this is in 1957. That was really chic then, eh? That architecture was really cutting edge. The understanding that there was more research at that time on brain functioning and its relationship to mental illness. There was an introduction of new psychotropic medications that went the world of difference particularly Largactyl, more effective treatment of symptoms when people could go home sooner. Before, we couldn't really treat because we didn't know what we were treating. We didn't know we didn't have the wherewithal or the means to treat people effectively. So Hillsborough Hospital was designed as a 90-bed acute care facility for shorter stays. And this was the first time that people could be voluntarily admitted. So their physician could admit them or they could ad admit themselves. People could say, I need help and they could be admitted. They didn't have to be committed. There was more choice. So it became a complex called Riverside Hospital with, with Hillsborough Hospital in the middle, the men's building to the, to the left, and the women's building to the right. It was all called Riverside Hospital. 
And for all the innovations that were happening at Hillsboro, uh, Riverside, the Riverside buildings were referred to as the back wards. And hundreds of people were still committed to the back wards and stayed for a long period of time. Many people started to develop what was called institutional behaviors. And you can imagine, if you're living in an institution for long periods of time, the kind of behaviors you need to get by and to cope and to survive are different than the kind of behaviors you need to live in the outside world. They learned how to be overly compliant, independent, manipulative to get what they wanted. And it became ingrained that was, was the way that they behaved. There were still a lot of uh, non-mental health admissions, particularly people with developmental challenges. And there was liberal use of electroconvulsive therapy and psychotropic medication, again, because we didn't have any other recourse. There was nothing else to be used. Am I allowed to do another sideline, Laurie? Oh, sure. Oh, sure, she says. <laughs> You're such a good storyteller, Tina. <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, I love this. And this is the story of Jean McClellan. You all know Jean McClellan? Yeah. Famous Canadian singer-songwriter. Well, he had a number of interactions with the PEI mental health system. First, in 18, 18, 1964, when he came to live with his aunt, he's from uh, Quebec and then roamed around Ontario for a while, and he came to live with his aunt who lived in Honol, and got himself a job as an attendant at Riverside Hospital. In those days, anybody could become an attendant. If uh, Ed McDonald was here, he'd tell you that his father, when he came back from the war, got a job as an attendant. There were no real criteria just besides being a strong male who was willing to manhandle patients. Um, so he did that and he stayed there until 1966 when he got on to Star Mrs. Jubilee. But sadly he did struggle with mental illness much of his life. Uh, much of it was undiagnosed for the longest time. Later in his life he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was hospitalized several times. However, in 1995, after returning from a hospital stay, he came home and chose to end his life. The reason I wanted to, to include this story is to show again that it can happen to anyone, and secondly, that it can be life-threatening. We don't pay the kind of attention to mental illness the way we do to cancer, other life-threatening illnesses like cancer or heart disease, but I digress. Drugs and medical treatment were not the only approach to care in those days. Involvement in uh, meaningful activities was always beneficial. Uh, patients had always worked, either on the farm or in the laundry or kitchen or elsewhere. They had been there involved in occupational therapy activities, recreation, there was entertainment and religious activities. A lot of community groups would come in and, and provide this. You can see here the square dance in the 1950s, and that's um, woodworking in, in what would become occupational therapy. I don't know how many of you remember or heard of Dr. Macbeth. Exactly. He was quite a name <coughs> in, his, in his time. He was the first child psychiatrist on the island. And he was the director, he became the director of the first two mental health clinics. So those are clinics outside the hospital. Because there was a beginning to, we were beginning to understand at that time in the 1950s that mental illness, some mental illnesses could be prevented if detected early, particularly among children. And also that people, when they're discharged from the hospital, they needed support. They couldn't just come home and they'd be hunky-dory. So, in 1952, the first mental health clinic was opened on the second floor of the Riley Building, which is at 49 Queen Street in Charlottetown. So you can see the second floor, there's just a few offices there, apparently. And the Guardian described it, to bring mental health care into patients' natural environments and everyday life situations. So mental health care is moving outside the hospital walls after 100 years of institutional care. A second clinic opened up in Summerside, and they were both uh, staffed by a range of mental health professionals, social workers, psychologists, guidance counselors. 
thing, awareness that was coming at the time, thanks in most part to the advocacy of parents groups, was an increasing recognition that people with developmental challenges have unique needs that are not best, best met in a psychiatric hospital for people with mental <coughs> illness. So Dr. Beck was instrumental in the establishment of Sherwood Home, which is on the grounds in between QEH and Hillsborough Hospital and right in front of the new palliative care center. People know where that is? <coughs> And uh, this was Sherwood Home for Children with Developmental Challenges in 1962, moving them out of Riverside Hospital. Can you imagine children with developmental challenges in a psychiatric hospital for adults? So finally they moved them out. There was also uh, a program for adults with developmental challenges called the Foster Home Program, where they placed people in foster homes permanently, usually on farms. Anybody experience that? Anybody remember that? So the movement was moving away from institutional care to community-based care. And just a bit later, but we can scroll up and just a bit later on that box, and that'll disappear for you. Scroll what? Get your cursor. Get your cursor and just hit the word later. I don't know the cursor is in. These two individuals are common, are well known, are common faces in the mental health scene from the 1860s on. Um, there was an increasing, increasingly we, we were understanding that uh, mental troubles were illnesses of the brain and that they were caused by an interaction of biological, psychological and social factors. So it just made sense then we, that we had to treat all those factors and that we needed a variety of mental health professionals to treat all those factors. <clears throat> so there, and we were also lucky at the time that in the early 1950s there were federal grants for training. So we sent a lot of people away to get uh, training in psychiatric care, uh, occupational therapists, social workers, psychologists, recreational therapists, and uh, <clears throat> psychiatrists like Dr. Bob Forsyth. As well, nurses were beginning to receive more psychiatric training. Nurses have always been the backbone of mental health care in anywhere, but it's certainly in PDI. But they were starting to get more specialized treatment, um, sorry, education too, and Emily Bryant was one of the uh, nurse educators at that time. Another big shift in the 1970s and 80s was based on research that showed that people with moderate, mild to moderate mental health conditions that became acute could be stabilized in, with short periods of hospitalization, one or two weeks, not months, not years, but just a couple of weeks. And so in 1980, um, PCH was the first to establish an acute short-term unit of 14 beds. And in 1982, when the QEH was being built, Unit 9 was included with uh, 24 beds. But that didn't happen easily. There was a long and hard uh, fight, a lot of advocacy on part of groups like Canadian Mental Health Association and members like Emily Bryant. There was a lot of reticence on the part of staff, of nursing staff, and a little bit as well at PCH and the public about mixing crazy patients with people with physical illnesses. There's a lot of misconceptions and misinformation and, and uh, misplaced fear about what was going to happen. But uh, happen it did. It was about 10 years later than it happened in the rest of Canada, but it did happen. And then, of course, in 2004, when the new PCH was opened, uh, a very modern, very lovely mental health unit was established there. Things at uh, Hillsborough Hospital, there was an increasing concern at the time that we, that we didn't have anything in PEI to help people with complex issues. People who had 
developmental challenges, behavioral issues, physical disabilities in addition to mental illnesses. So people had a whole array, array of issues that needed to be dealt with. So we built a special care center, which now we just call Hillsborough Hospital. It's all one and the same. Built in 1984 after the demolition of the two older buildings, the, the men's building and the women's building. So 272 beds trend, were replaced by 100 beds. So a lot of people appropriately, particularly people with developmental challenges, were placed elsewhere to more appropriate settings. I wanted to include this. I didn't have this in the slides for the launch because I wanted to talk about the sense of family that there was, particularly at Hillsborough Hospital. Staff still talk about it today, about this being a great place to work because we like each other and we get along. Um, right from the beginning, many staff have worked at the hospital for many years creating a sense of family. One staff person I talked to said, it was my place. I found family there a close group of people where older staff looked out for you. And they not only worked together, but they played together. There's the nurses hockey team in the 1920s, and a, a picnic in the 1980s. There was a very much a sense of oneness there. And this atmosphere spilled over to the, to the patients, who said that they felt safe and accepted, because they kept going back to a place where they knew people, and where people knew them. One patient said that the H in the hospital sign for him meant home. But this, is, this has pros and cons, right? Because if you're comfortable at home, you don't want to leave home. So people sometimes stayed a little longer than they needed to because it was so comfortable there. And the, a major shift in mental health care happened in the 1980s when community mental health flourished. We began to understand that mental health, like physical health, is on a continuum. From mild mental health issues that many of us deal with, to severe mental illness. And that mild to moderate issues could be dealt with or treated best at home, where people could live at home, stay connected to their social networks, stay connected to their jobs or school. But we had to bring in an expert from away because we didn't have anybody here. So we brought in Dr. Sam Malcolmson from the Clark Institute, and he was the director of mental health for three years. He established three community mental health centers, the Richmond Center in um, Charlottetown, in Montague. It was in the basement of Riverview Manor, and in Summerside in the public health building on Linden Avenue. People were beginning to be referred to as clients, not patients. Um, they received counseling and support from multidisciplinary teams, and we now have five of these across the aisle. Another big movement at the time was the deinstitutionalization movement. Because of all kinds of reasons, we began to understand that people were not that well off living in institutions for long periods of time, that they had rights, that care was better in the community, that care was expensive in hospitals. Um, and there was a new generation of psychotropic medications that were more effective and with fewer side effects. So people with, so even people with severe mental illness could live at home. So there was a massive closing of beds at QEH and uh, Hillsborough Hospital between the mid 80s to the mid 90s from a hunt 191 to 71 beds. Um, they did a lot of training of folks before they discharged them because these people had been in hospitals so much they needed to learn a lot of life skills and other skills. And they, they still needed support and for their medications and just moral support and social support. And they received that at uh, the McGill Community Mental Health Center, which was their residence for the tuberculosis center. What was that called? What was that center called? Eric Fern. Fern. The Eric Fern. Eric Fern. 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 Yes. So that became the McGill Center. Now, 
The provincial mental health system was not the only game in town. The Canadian Mental Health Association, PEI, had been doing this work since it was established in 1959. It ran the White Cross program in the 1960s, which was a social recreational program. I'm just going over time, I see that. I only have a page left. Do I okay? There was a recognition. Um, they were among the first to recognize that people with long-term severe mental illness could live productive lives in the community if they had the right supports. So they were the first to establish housing that still exists, the Longworth House, um, for people who had been discharged from hospital. They also understood that they needed more than housing, so they established what are called clubhouses in um, Charlottetown, Summerside and Alberton which provide not only housing, but social supports, employment training, and employment supports. And now we're in the new millennium. And it's not a, it's not a smooth ride, it's not a perfect system. There are a lot of challenges. There have been numerous reports on the status of the mental health system. There are issues around coordination, turf issues, issues around who should be admitted to Hillsborough Hospital, who shouldn't, who should be kicked out of Hillsborough Hospital, inadequate funding, dated facilities, recruitment and retention is an issue. There's a lot of press, for instance, about psychiatrists, getting and keeping psychiatrists. And stigma is alive and well in Prince Edward Island. One person I talked, one social worker I interviewed said that even though there is a community mental health center in Surrey, very few people go because they do not want to be seen by their friends and family members walking in to get service. <coughs> that said, there are all sorts of good things happening too. In the year 2000, there was mental health reform with crisis teams in the ER, community outreach teams. There's an increasing, increasing integration of mental health and addiction services because research was showing that um, 60 to 80 percent of people with addictions have mental health issues. Kel Surprise, right? There's a reason people become addicted. Um, so the new uh, PCH has a wing that is called the Mental Health and Addictions Wing that includes inpatient mental health, uh, community mental health, and community addictions that they can work collaboratively. Um, CMHA still does its good work. Uh, in the 2010s, there are new prevention and early intervention programs, and there's an increasingly positive public understanding of mental illness. This is. Uh, January is uh, Bell's uh, Let's Talk month, and people are getting it. People are understanding that mental Ill what mental illness is and what it isn't, and that it's okay to talk about it, and increasingly people are seeking help. So we now do have a much broader range of services, including but far beyond the asylum. We have come a long way since the 1800s, but we still have a lot of work to do to adequately address the mental health needs of Islanders. And that's me. <laughs>
So Mr. Brown said, well, but I want to join the Army anyway, because this was at the time of the First World War. And he knew that he couldn't get enlisted in uh, Nova Scotia, so Bunnell gave him the train fare to go to Ontario to enlist. <laughs> And then on the boat going over, both of them as soldiers met on the boat going over to Europe again. Now, unfortunately, Brown died in the war, but Benel came home. Interesting. Yes, Ian. Thank you very much, Tina. It was very interesting. Um, you did make some mention about drugs and trends in drug use in um, uh, psychiatric care over the, uh, the years. Uh, I wonder if you would comment on a problem that's facing the mental health care field, that has been facing it for decades, as I'm sure you know, but that's the, uh, the formidable power of the pharmaceutical industry, mm. and uh, <coughs> this is directly connected, of course, to the mental health care costs. So I wonder if you might comment asking me to comment based on my own personal experience now. And not, your study not, Well, yeah. Uh, I worked in the mental health field all my working life. Physicians, uh, psychiatrists for the most part, um, understand mental illness physiologically. And so they see that the best way to treat mental illness is through physiological interventions, i.e. medications. And Physicians in the pharmaceutical industry are hand in glove, right? So that's, that's sort of where that happens. Those of us who are not physicians but who worked in the mental health field know that there's so much other care that can happen outside of medication. I'm not dissing medications. Medications are wonderful for people who need them. For some people it's for a short period, for some people it's for their whole life. But it's not just that. We need to pay more attention to the other approaches to care, like counseling, like occupational therapy, employment. And I think with that comes more psychologists. Yes, psychologists and social workers. I often, I often struggle when I hear about the concerns about the shortage of of psychiatrists here, and I'm thinking, well, we could use other people. Exactly. And we will. Some of them are being trained right now as a cohort in the psychologist program. That's right. Yeah. We started a new clinical psychology program here. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, mentioned there in your presentation, um, what do you call it about? Um, there's an institutional mentality. What did you call institutional it? behavior. Yeah, there was some term that you give it where people do, um, you know, they, the, the patients become what, what you were saying, that they, they become compliant and, and dependent and manipulative. It's the same in, for instance, in, in jails, right? And it's, it's institutional. Yeah, it's just that, yeah, 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 people do what they need to survive within an institutional setting, which is not like it's out here. You wanted to make a point about that, sorry? I just wanted to um, clarify what that term was, and it was just, yeah, how does that happen? <coughs> yeah, you can explain more, how does that happen? It's, 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 how, you it's how you survive. If you, if you don't have much power and you're not well, and somebody else has the power, well, you do whatever you need to get what you need. Right? So you do become rather compliant, you become dependent, mm -hmm. and you learn how to work around the system. It's a form of adaptation. Yeah, exactly, a form of adaptation. Good, good way to put it. Yes? Through your research, did you find that there was a change in diagnosis? I know, you know, over the years you'll see something new, attention <coughs> deficit disorder, for example, <coughs> comes out and it seems to all of a sudden there's a uh, huge number of people being diagnosed with it. And then there'll be another one, well, they were diagnosed with that, but really we think they have this. And so, you know, that one sort of starts to come. Did you see those sort of waves when you were doing your 
research around mental health diagnosis. And again, I'll be drawing more on my own personal experience and on, on the historical research I did because it doesn't didn't really speak to that. I think probably for a long time a lot of people were underdiagnosed. Right? We didn't we didn't have diagnostic categories to understand what a certain kind of behavior was like or a certain kind of suffering was like. And now we seem to be on the other end where we are medicalizing all kinds of behavior which is outside of the norm. So we tend to medicalize it, so we might over overdo it. And there seems to be, and it's the same for me for, with autism spectrum disorder and um, my favorite oppositional defiant disorder, um, you know, that, that they become new and popular and, and people desperate to understand grab on to them. I don't think people do it in a malicious way, but it, they do kind of become trendy for a while and then they fade away. Because I know as a kid I can remember people saying, she has bad nerves. Yeah. And a, a friend's mother had bad nerves. And so every fall they would go for a little trip, just her and her husband. And there's, you know, she had bad nerves. <laughs> or there was hardening up the arteries, which now we would call, you know, maybe dementia or yeah. something else. Yeah. But it was, when their memory would start to go, it would be, oh, they must have hardening up the arteries. Well, we, uh, that was the understanding at the yes. time. You know, in all fairness, people just spoken the terms that they understood at the time. Um, my favorite one is nervous breakdown. Because I can just see these little neurons breaking, right? Which of course isn't what happens, but people still use those terms. Oh, yes. Still use those, well he had a nervous breakdown. But that, that's not helpful because it's so generic. It doesn't really speak to, well what was it? Was it anxiety? Was it was it depression? Was it schizophrenia? You know, I mean, we, we have a much broader sense of, <coughs> broader ways of, of describing different kinds of stuff. Well, the DSM, uh, the right. Bible for the Stikers, that, you know, certainly broken so many things down. Yeah. It's 900 pages long now. It's this thick. 900. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it's been used for not so positive, like homosexuality used to be in there. I mean, there are all sorts of things that, you know, where we labeled things that we didn't understand or didn't like or something, but but it's it, it's generally broken down in, into three categories. Thought disorders, affective disorders, and personality disorders. And then other. Jim. Uh, when you were doing your research, would you have had access to patient records from the early days? or? I, I could have. There are some records at uh, the public archives, but I needed special permission for that and decided not to get into that right away. And that was only for a certain period of time. That was during the Falconwood era. And I'm sure, though, that in the basement of Hillsborough Hospital, there are all kinds of those things as well. So. I'm thinking that come time for replacing Hillsborough Hospital, all sorts of interesting artifacts will come to the surface. Jim? I use the word, the word pauper. When I think of pauper, I think of pauper's grave, or the indigent and poor, or even the homeless. Were people committed there because they were homeless or indigent, and this was a way to get them off the streets? It's like the workhouses, right? They wanted to get the poor people off the streets and keep them busy and, and productive and doing something. And for them, some people were, were happy to do that because it was better than starving. Mm -hmm. And remember, even though we call them paupers or homeless, there is a reason that they yeah. are homeless. And there is a yeah. reason that they are paupers. And usually it's because something's going on, addictions or mental health issues. Or, so it's okay. yeah. it was just a term used at that time. I was, I have a 16 year old grandson and I was doing homework with him the other night and he was on a text about somebody 
most people my age, I really have no recollection of anybody that I knew of that exhibited what I would consider a form of mental illness. Is mental illness today much more prevalent, or is it just much better diagnosed? Yeah, that's, a, that's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. A number of the people that, quite a few of the people that I interviewed and worked in the system said it's much more common today that because we have a more stressful world and all kinds of reasons that there, there is more anxiety and depression, things that are, are reactions to how complex our world is. But I think it was probably underdiagnosed. I did that too. I did give them that. I said, we did not have the internet, we didn't have incident news of tragedy. kids who were uh, in what we call, quote unquote, have not families that want what everybody else has, but they will never have that $250 pair of sneakers. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said to them, I use that as an example, I said, if you're, you were from a family that really was barely surviving, you see everybody else wearing a $250 pair of sneakers, you know you'll never get them. Eventually, after a while, you get so discouraged and so depressed because you were. Now I know that's a problem. That, that, that's my other favorite overused diagnosis is post traumatic stress disorder. I hear about people, well, she, she broke up with her boy, her boyfriend, dumped her. Yeah. She has post traumatic stress disorder. But no, I do wonder, like, I, I often wonder, I really, I thought about it for a long time afterwards, and I really don't know anybody. In my peer group, even when I was like, you know, post secondary, couldn't. Well, that, that's um, interesting because when I would tell people, because it took me three years to write and kind of get this thing to press, uh, when I would tell people what I was doing, inevitably people would come tell me stories about people in their people in their family, or people in their community that they know. Well, he was, you know, a few bricks short of a load kind of guy, or he would get crazy every full moon. A lot of people talked about people in their communities who probably had what we would call the importance. Well, I mean, among adults, yes, I can remember my parents saying, and I know people that are living in parents' custody home, they never lived in the life because yeah. they were never allowed inside the house. Mm -hmm. And even up until 1960, there were still parents who kept Child had Down syndrome, for instance. I know a family that the mother kept the child at home for years and years until he finally, through somebody, social worker, whatever, was aware of the situation. And that child became a perfectly functioning adult, holding down a job and everything else. When he was taken down with the home system, he was sustained by that. He was different. So. Mm -hmm. Louise, Please. did I see your hand coming oh, yeah. up? Okay. Oh, that's great. Um, I have a 16 year old who deals with, with um, mental illness and on a very positive side, she has no stigma attached to it whatsoever. She's not shy to talk about it, she asks for help, she accepts help. But one thing that does drive her crazy is that among her group of really good friends, there's one particular girl and she's like, oh, I wanted to go wherever, but I was scheduled for work and I couldn't go, I'm so depressed. And Lily says, I know, she just doesn't understand, but I'm thinking to myself, Honey, <laughs> obviously you don't deal with depression because if you did, you wouldn't just throw that word around. <laughs> but you know, she gets it. Like people don't. If you, if you haven't experienced it, you don't get it. Like it's not because you're sad. It's not because you're pissed off. It's not because whatever. It is an illness. But anyway, so um, yes. So there is there is hope that the stigma will will perhaps not be as strong in. in coming uh, generations, but yeah, she said it's not any different than if I had a heart problem. Yeah. So. But, but that's a little slower in, mm -hmm. in changing. Yes. That's a little slower in changing yes. it. And I always try, like to remind people too that it does exist on a continuum. So there, we do all have mental health issues from time to time, right? Yeah. We've, I've, I've felt anxious and depressed, mm -hmm. right? But I've never had depression. Mm -hmm. And I've yeah. never had an anxiety disorder. And I've never had to live with it my whole life, yeah. which some people do. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it is all on a continuum, yes. and people can understand it that way. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling her that where she is now on the continuum, like she won't 
stay there. Like yeah. right now, she needs medication, and she's perfectly accepting of that. But I said, you know, it's almost like you will get well, you will get better, you will be in a different part of the, you know, the spectrum, and and you know, getting help and knowing that it's treatable is a big part of that. We we do live in a different world. Mm -hmm. It's true. I would still argue, though, from the mental health care side, that as the Kirby report said in, in, the, in the 2000s, we're still in the shadows. Mm -hmm. Mental health care is still in the shadows. Yeah. And let's not kid ourselves and say, well, it's okay, we all know about mental illness now, and then not fund it. Right. Mm -hmm. And not provide it the supports that it needs. That still needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to have poster children for mental illness. Mm -hmm. Someone living with schizophrenia is not sexy, right? They're not cute, yeah. right? It's hard to sell it. Mm -hmm. But we have a responsibility mm -hmm. as a society to help these individuals, to understand why they are the way they are and to help them. Yeah. So as much as stigma is changing, funding is not a company. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in many ways, it's consistently falling apart, too, because psychiatrists are overworked, they're not bringing in enough, as we were saying, support staff. And so really, right now, we're in a crisis, so we say. And I mean, well, I think we're both, I think there is a bit of a, there are all sorts of issues, but there's all, for me, there's a lot of hope right now, too. There are all lots of initiatives right now. I think they have a new master plan in place where they're infusing a lot more resources into community care and they're going to build a new facility where Hillsborough Hospital is. I mean, it's things are changing, but it's a slow process and we just need to speed it up a little yeah. and, and put more into it. And that's just my opinion, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> thank you so much, Tina. I really, really appreciate what you've brought to our, our conversation tonight and our knowledge and understanding of mental health on Prince Edward Island over the last three, three centuries. and. Yeah, we have a long way to go, but this helps. I'm sure this helps in the speeding up. So, as always, I have a gift for you, which is a book published by Island Studies Press, and it was hard to find one that is probably not already in your home. <laughs> this one was published just before. Well, I'm, glad it's, I'm glad it's not potatoes because I don't like potatoes. Oh! <laughs> Acknowledge uh, Sharon Myers in the room. Uh, who <laughs> Sharon uh, did a lot of research on uh, an interesting individual called Minnie McGee. I didn't include oh, yeah. her story yeah, here yes. because Sharon's the expert on Minnie McGee. Oh. So you should uh, talk to Sharon about Minnie McGee and just her as an example of what happened in the mental health system in 1918, and who and she ended up staying in the system until the 1950s, right? Where did she go then in 1950? She died. She died. She died. Yes. <laughs> oh, sorry, I shouldn't have laughed. Um, Sharon actually did a lecture in our lecture series yep. a couple of years ago on that topic yep. as well. Um, I should mention, um, in case you haven't noticed, that um, the bookmark has some of um, uh, Tina's books there, and I realized when I was sitting there, I don't have one, so I'm going to go get one shortly. And I will even sign it for you. And it'll get signed. And one last thing before we take off, our next lecture is going to be on February the 18th, same time, same place. It'll be Dr. Ed McDonald talking about the rise of green tourism on Prince Edward Island. It's called The Goose and the Golden Egg, the Environmental Turn in Island Tourism, 1970-1990. So stay tuned. So again, thank you very much, Tina. Thank you all for coming.